are a lot of videos on YouTube about Planck length and Planck time as the smallest units of space-time. So what are Planck units, really? And are Planck length and Planck time the smallest units of space-time? We will take an objective look at this question. There are several important constants that are used in defining Planck units. They are the speed of light in a vacuum, the gravitational constant, the reduced Planck constant, Boltzmann's constant, the permeability of free space, or the electric constant, the permittability of free space, or the magnetic constant. It is not used, but it is involved in Planck's constant. All of these constants equal one in Planck units. This is a pretty important fact about these units. It turns out that there are two variations of Planck units. Planck's original units use Planck's constant, while the modern units use the reduced Planck's constant. This means that they differ by a factor of the square root of 2 pi. As a result, I will deal with both of them to determine which are truly natural units. They will be dealt with in parallel for easy comparison. Here we have Planck length and Planck time. The original units are on top and the modern ones are below. The difference in both cases is the square root of 2 pi. Here is Planck mass and Planck temperature. The original units are on the top and the modern units are on the bottom. Once again, they differ by a factor of the square root of 2 times pi. Here is the Planck charge. The original unit is on the right and the modern unit is on the left. Once again, they differ by a factor of the square root of 2 times pi. Here are several derived Planck units, Planck area and Planck volume. Planck area is the square of Planck length, and Planck volume is the cube of Planck length. Once again, the original Planck unit is on top, and the modern one is on the bottom. Now here, the difference in the Planck areas is the factor of 2 pi, because it is the square of the square root of 2 pi. With Planck volume, they differ with the cube of the square root of 2 pi. Here we have Planck momentum and Planck energy. Once again, the original units are on top and the modern ones are on the bottom. In both cases, they once again differ by the factor of the square root of 2 pi. Here we have Planck force and Planck density. Once again, the original units are on top and the modern versions are on the bottom. Now, Planck force is identical in both cases because Planck's constant does not factor into them. The original differs from the modern in this case by dividing the modern version by 2 pi. Here we have Planck acceleration and Planck frequency. Once again, the original units are on top and the modern ones are on the bottom. In this case, they both differ by dividing the modern version by the square root of 2 times pi. At first glance, it may look like this eliminates the idea of natural units, but not really. All it shows is that there is more than one way of having these constants end up equaling one. It just depends upon which constants you choose. Actually, in determining which units are the real natural units, we need to find which one works the best. The solution is a proper matching between mass and length. This matching includes the fact that the energy of the mass unit needs to fit the energy of a photon with a wavelength equal to the length unit. In the formula for the wavelength of a photon, the wavelength equals Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the photon's energy. When we substitute mc squared for the energy, the formula becomes L equals Planck's constant over Planck mass times the speed of light. This has to be valid for a true set of natural units. Also, the smallest possible black hole would have to have an energy level whose wavelength for a photon is twice the Schwarzschild radius. This is so that the wavelength would be equal to the diameter of the black hole. The reason this is the smallest possible black hole is that any mass that would fit into it would have to have a shorter wavelength and therefore have a greater mass and therefore a greater Schwarzschild radius. A smaller amount of mass would have a wavelength larger 
than the diameter of this black hole, and therefore being capable of forming a black hole. So you have to take two times the formula for the Schwarzschild radius has equal to Planck's constant divided by mass times the speed of light. This results in a formula of four times the gravitational constant times the mass divided by the speed of light squared equals Planck's constant divided by mass times the speed of light. This means that these two conditions must be met in a fashion consisting of integers for the true natural units. Before continuing, to avoid confusion, from now on I will be referring to Planck's original units as quantum units. Note that we start with the wavelength formula and then substitute in the formula for the unit of mass, followed by a simplification. Next, the Planck unit side requires converting Planck's constant into the reduced Planck's constant. However, the quantum unit side remains unchanged. We then flip the radical, resulting in the final version on both sides. Next, each side requires a little simplification, resulting in the bottom formulas. In both cases, the radical and what they contain are the units of length. What it shows is that with the Planck units, the wavelength formula does not equal Planck length. Instead, it equals 2 pi Planck length. This means that these units fail the test. However, with the quantum units, the wave formula exactly equals quantum length. This means that these units pass the test. At this stage of calculating the minimum Schwarzschild radius, both sets of units follow the same formula. They continue to be identical until the formula is reduced to mass. It is at this point where it starts to separate because the Planck unit side has to be converted to the reduced Planck's constant. At this point with the Planck units, we get Planck length times the square root of pi over 2. And on the quantum unit side, we have m equals 1 half quantum mass. Interestingly, these two values end up being the same. Both sets of units calculate the same value for the minimum mass of a black hole. Now it is time to calculate the minimum Schwarzschild radius. So in each case, we start with our calculated formula for mass and the formula for the Schwarzschild radius. We then plug the mass formula into the Schwarzschild radius formula to get the combined formula for each of the mass units at the bottom. We then simplify each of the two formulas, resulting in the respective formulas for each set of units at the bottom. This results in the smallest Schwarzschild radius for the Planck units to be Planck length times the square root of 2 pi. And for the quantum units, the smallest Schwarzschild radius is equal to the quantum length. As a result, the Planck units failed the test, but the quantum units passed the test. Both sets of units produce the same minimum Schwarzschild radius. However, that radius is equal to the quantum length. This information makes it abundantly clear that the quantum units, the original Planck units, is the true natural units. They are the ones that the math really works with. They are also the ones where the math truly works with the constants equal to 1. This means that quantum units are going to be the units used in the information universe. They will also serve as the units for the quantization of gravity. This change may be one of the reasons for the difficulty in unifying quantum mechanics and general relativity. As a result, these quantum units are the natural units that form part of the basis of reality. They are quantum length, quantum time, quantum mass, quantum charge, and quantum temperature. They will form an important part of our unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity. We also have our derived units of quantum area, quantum volume, quantum momentum, quantum energy, quantum force, quantum density, quantum acceleration, and quantum frequency. So what does all this mean? In and of itself, none of this means that there is anything special about these units. There is nothing in these, for example, that indicate that quantum length and time are the smallest possible units of space-time. They are simply natural units where the fundamental constants are equal to 1. It means that these units are natural units for measuring important physical quantities. 
The fact that this is possible is an important part of an information-based universe. It is also expected if the universe is a result of an intelligent programmer. The following theoretical deductions can be made about quantum units. One is that quantum length is the minimum possible Schwarzschild radius. Furthermore, the gravitational field is probably quantitized at this level. In conclusion, what are commonly called Planck units are not Max Planck's original units. The modern units substitute the reduced Planck constant for Planck's constant. This throws the figures off by the square root of 2 pi. The original Planck units, not the modern ones, are the real natural units. The original Planck units are better referred to as quantum units to avoid confusion. Quantum length is the minimum possible radius for a black hole. This strongly suggests that the gravitational field is quantitized at quantum length. Upcoming topics include the key concepts, working with special relativity, unifying quantum mechanics and general relativity, quantum gravity, what this says about reality, unifying natural and supernatural, fine-tuning the theory, predictions, if you like this video, please press the subscribe button to subscribe to this channel and also give it a thumbs up. You can also support this channel with a donation by using the link in the description.